we opened up with all of these love stories because we were exposed to them growing up and it's influenced a lot of what we see as romance, as the love that we're looking for. You know, there's that couple from that one story, from that one movie that somehow, some way infiltrated the idea of the type of love that you're looking after. Yeah. And it's impacted not just the type of love, but even our lists and the things that we want to have in our significant other. Singles, y'all got a list? You know the list, what I'm talking about? Married people, you still have a list. It's just a to-do list now, not as much of a what you're looking for list, but we still got a list. I, I know, thinking about our story, that I checked off every box on your list, Every right? box and more. Everything that you oh, were looking yeah. for. Uh-huh. You, when you were a kid, you just pictured yourself with a white pastor. That's what you thought. <laughs> that was your dream man right there, right? Real talk, um, when I was dating, <laughs> when I was dating, I just didn't picture myself with a guy like this. Wow. Come on, let's be real. I, and, and the reason why is because when you start dating and you start like figuring out, okay, who am I attracted to? What am I looking for in a boyfriend and that guy I have a crush on? I didn't realize until I look back now that I had a type. Mm. I don't know about any of you guys, but if you've dated a few different people, there's this type that you kind of go back to oh, and everyone... Type. Everyone around you knows the type except you, and then you look back and it's like, okay, nothing like my type, I but, the type. but God oftentimes brings you the exact person that you are Come on, to somebody. Be. Yes. That's right. And that's you. You have blessed me. In God so many opened ways. up your eyes. Oh, in so many ways. Come on, you were blind and now you <laughs> no, see. Oh, hallelujah. <laughs> well, baby, let me tell you, you are always my dream girl. Aww. You always checked off everything on my list. All right, all right, all right. We can all relate with the list because we've all had one or we either have one now, but if we be honest, some of the things on our list aren't always realistic. Sometimes it ain't even righteous. Mm. Come on, can we be real? Mm-hmm. Let's, we're gonna get real today in church. Uh, the issue with our world right now is I think everyone's trying to define like what a good relationship is supposed to look like. And, and I have this problem because every time I go online, I just feel like every single person has a podcast now. Y'all seen this? Like, everybody's got a podcast, and everybody's got an opinion, and I'm like, I don't know that you really earned that right to have that opinion there. Uh, Everybody has something to say about everything. Right. And I feel like with all these podcasts, with all these relationship advice, I mean, I I see some of these podcasts where they got all these young adults together, and it's just... It's just scary, a little bit scary sometimes to hear the state of our generation and when it comes to their understanding of a healthy relationship. We got a lot of talking heads and a lot of people that don't know what they're talking about. And I think that even in the church, it can be a temptation for pastors to move into this category, what what I call thought leaders. These are people that like, they're known for their wise sayings and the books they've written and their eloquent ideas. And the reality is, is that as pastors, we are not called to be thought leaders. We are called to be Bible teachers. If we get up here and we just teach you our ideas and our opinions and our thoughts, that has absolutely no power to change your life. We're not qualified to do that. We didn't earn that right. But what we are here to do is to teach you what the Word of God says. Because the Word of God, it has the power and the authority to alter your lives for the better. And so when we talk about relationships and what we're going to talk about today, really throughout this entire series, we're not here to share our own ideas. We're not here to give you, although God has blessed us with an amazing marriage, and I'm so grateful for the healthy relationship that we have, we are not here to give you the tips we've learned We're here to give you the truth that's found in the Word of God. I'm so grateful for that, too, because it's kind of a relief off of my shoulders. I don't know, sometimes coming up here, just like what you said, the temptation of always having a thought, always having an opinion, always having something to say. It's like, man, as a Christ follower, all I want to do is point back to Christ. All I want to do is encourage you to look to Jesus for the answers. Come on. And the incredible thing about what this what this sermon series is, is pointing back to the source. Yeah. To live out a godly marriage, to live out a godly relationship, you've got to look to the source. Yeah, 2 Timothy 4, chapter 2, Paul tells young Pastor Timothy, he says, preach the word. Somebody say, preach the word. Preach the word. That should be your desire when you walk into this church. Your desire for me, your expectation from us is that we preach 
the word. Somebody say, preach the word. It says, be prepared in season and out of season. Correct, rebuke, and encourage. That tells us that sometimes the word is going to bring correction. Sometimes it's going to be a rebuke. Sometimes it's going to encourage. But all three of those are ministries of the word of God. Verse three. Now, if anything defines our generation at this time, it's got to be this passage right here. It says, for the time will come when people will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they'll gather around themselves a great number of podcasters <laughs> to say what their itching ears want to hear. They'll turn their ears away from the truth and turn aside to myths. But Paul says to young Timothy, preach the word, even when it's countercultural, even when you don't understand it, even when you're not fully there yet. Come on, some of us, we know what the word of God says, but we're not living it out right now. That's okay. We're people in process. We are allowing God to transform us day after day. You don't come to church because you're perfect and you have it figured out. You come to church because you need Jesus and Jesus is here to change your life. I think in a world that's struggling with confusion, it needs a church that's fighting for clarity. And that's what we're here to do in this series. We're here to fight for clarity, not our ideas, but the authoritative word of God. And in order to do that, we gotta go back to the beginning. The way beginning. The way beginning. Genesis, Genesis 1, 1, 1. If you have your Bibles, open up to Genesis chapter 1. We're going to be hanging out there today. Why don't you read that first verse for us? It says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And we think to ourselves, okay, that's the start of it. We've got to start there. Let's believe it. But in 2023, even that can be controversial. That's right. As Christians, <laughs> newsflash, we believe that God created everything. We believe that God created you that he formed you and he fashioned you. You didn't just happen out of some cosmic goo that was you know, whirling around. God designed you on purpose, with a purpose. And what I love about Christianity is that it truly places value on you as an individual. You're not an accident. That's right. You're not a mistake. God made you on purpose for a purpose. And because he is the designer, he defines what our lives are supposed to look like. And it goes on. Genesis chapter one, verse 26. It says, then God said, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness. Now, we hear that and it's kind of weird because this is starting off and it's just God. But when he says, let us make man in our image and our likeness, the reason it says that is this is the first glimpse we have into the Trinitarian Godhead, the three in one, the Father, Son, and Spirit. God is saying, I'm gonna make mankind in my image to reflect me. The animals, the plants, the creatures, all these things are great, but humanity is going to reflect my beauty, my power, who I am in perfect connection with myself. It says, so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock and the wild animals, over all creatures that move along the ground. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them and said, be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, over every living creature that moves on the ground. What we want you all to know today is that God created everything with intention, even your relationships. Godly relationship is meant to be fruitful, not wasteful. And a godly relationship is worth fighting for. That's right. And that's what we're going to dive into today. The scripture says, be fruitful and multiply. God wants your relationship to bear fruit in your life. The question is, what is that fruit supposed to look like? What is the fruit that we should be going after? And I want to start in this verse 27. It says, so God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. The fruit that God wants you to bear in your relationship and in your life, first and foremost, is the fruit of Christ-likeness. Um, in our backyard, we have hundreds of plants, like a lot of different varieties, a lot of plants, and it's a very exciting time because it's spring season. Uh, we had someone come over this past week, and he took a look at the backyard. The windows kind of just go across, and so you can see all of the varieties. He said, Trin, which one is your favorite? And it kind of took me by surprise because I love them all so much. Farmer so Trin. So much, Farmer Trin. <laughs> I love my plants. 
And it took me a moment, but I finally settled on one. I pointed to this little tree about this tall, not even in the ground, it's still in a pot. And I said, that fig tree right there that's got like five leaves starting to come out, that's my favorite plant. And he's like, really? And I said, yep, and the reason why, and the thing that you don't know is that that fig tree is a cutting from my mom's fig tree. You see, my mother has been caring for this ginormous tree in her backyard for years on years on years. And for many years, I have gleaned from it, which means that I have received the fruit from this tree to take home and to have for myself, sharing sometimes. I love figs. <laughs> And I was pointing to this tree and I said, you don't understand, like, I love this tree so much. And she had cut this off at one point because she knew I loved figs and she rooted it, she stuck it in soil, she gave it to me and she said, okay, now you take care of this. For three years, I have tended to this fig tree. No fruit yet, but this is the year, people. I know it's gonna happen. I know it will happen. Sometimes it takes a little time for the good stuff to come, you know? And so I'm caring for this tree, and in the midst of the waiting, in the midst of knowing, hey, I don't have the fruit yet, I can trust that this tree will produce fruit. Mm. An incredible thing that I want you all to know today is that the fruit of a propagated plant is the image of its parent plant. Like that's what I rest on, that's what I know. And as believers of Christ, we're meant to be duplicates of Christ. Come on. We are his duplication, we are his propagation. He created us for, an image, for a reason, to be of his own image. And not just us to be Christ bearers and to be, to represent Christ, but even our relationships are going to represent him as well. That's so good. Uh, uh, that fig tree is never gonna produce oranges. I almost thought you, you were gonna go somewhere else, and I was like, uh. <laughs> It will produce fruit in Jesus' name, but it's never gonna produce oranges. It doesn't decide one day that it wants to make apples. It's a fig tree because it came from a fig tree. And I'm reminded of that scripture where Jesus says this, I am the vine and you are the branches. Mm -hmm. That fruit that God wants to come from your life, the fruit of the Spirit. that we find in Galatians 5, it's the fruit of the life of Christ that flows through you, not because you earned it or tried for it, but because you belong to Jesus. If you are a Christian, that word Christian means little Christ. It means that you are a part of the DNA. You are a propagation from the parent plant. Jesus Christ, that DNA lives in you. But here's the problem in our world, before we even get to the relationship aspect, we have to get this down for ourselves. Because I don't know that we truly embrace our God-given purpose and identity as individuals first. That what we are here on this earth to do is to glorify Jesus. We've been taught by culture, by entertainment, by media, by politics, that we are here to have fun, to live the lives we wanna live to fulfill every desire, to, to, to be successful, to make money. And that is not why you were designed. Go back to the beginning. God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. God created you to represent him to look like him, to glorify him. If you are a Christian, this is your primary purpose in life. But here's what happens. If we don't know what our purpose is, then we begin to complicate and bring chaos into every relationship that we, certain, we, bring, we put ourselves into. Because here's what we believe. We think God created me. We believe that for the most part. But then we also believe God created me, but you will complete me. And so, yeah, I'm God's creation, but really a relationship is what I need to fulfill me. Or, or these things, this money, this stuff, all of that is what I need to complete me in life. You weren't created to be completed by somebody else. You weren't created to be completed by things and stuff of this world. You were created to be completed by Christ and to glorify him and to be the image of that. And, and, and just in a real, very real sense, I think the reason why uh, this, this becomes a struggle in marriage is because we don't deal with it in self first. Like if my personal purpose is to glorify Christ, then that's gonna dictate my relationship. That's right and what I get into a relationship for. But if my personal purpose is to satisfy my own needs and desires, 
then this person now becomes the one responsible to meet those needs. And when she doesn't, what happens? I become bitter, I get frustrated, angry, I go searching somewhere else. And I found this in our marriage. The times I have a hard time forgiving her is when I forget who I am. Look at what Ephesians 4 says. It says, be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other just as Christ forgave you. When I have a hard time forgiving her, it's because I forgot how I've been forgiven. I forget that it's my role to forgive. I forget that it's my job to serve her and to love her selflessly. But when I put her in the position of God because she now needs to meet all my needs and and to be this perfect person, that's a recipe for disappointment. And this is why our marriages are struggling. Not because this person doesn't get it, but because I have not internalized my own personal purpose first to glorify Jesus. I think the main thing that I get from that too is knowing not just yourself in Christ and that everything in life is leading you back to Christ, that's including then your relationship. And so when it gets hard, when there are challenges, when there are disagreements or conflict, we can think back to the fact that all of this is pointing back towards him. Yeah. He longs for us to go back to him. Yeah. And I think that the reason why we struggle with this in our lives is because even if you just read this scripture, it's so definitive and it's so absolute, that's offensive to us. I don't know about you, but it's offensive to me. God created man in his own image, period. In the image of God, he created them, period. Male and female, he created them, period. And scripture has this way of being so absolute and so black and white and so definitive, and yet you and I live in a world of wrestling and struggle where it's not so cut and dry where it's difficult because to be honest, that sounds great, God, but I'm wrestling with my own identity. I'm struggling with my own insecurities. Sure, I'm supposed to be confident in who I'm supposed to be, but I'm not. Come on, how many of you right now, you're struggling with insecurity in your own identity somewhere? Maybe you're a mom, a new mom, and your season of life has changed and what you used to be and know yourself for has now completely altered. You're struggling in your identity. And so it's like, great, I was created to glorify God, but I don't even know who I am right now. Maybe you're struggling in your career, in your profession, your sexuality, your gender identity. We don't live in a world that's just so perfect and cut and dry. We're wrestling. And when we read scriptures like this, it seems so difficult. And I think that's why we have a hard time in church because I'm not there yet. I'm wrestling right now. I don't know. I haven't got all this defined, but here's what I love about Jesus. Think about Jesus for a second. He came to this earth in a body that wasn't his. He wrapped himself in flesh. You want to talk about somebody who left everything they knew and embodied themselves in something completely different than where they came from. Not only that, but the first season of Jesus' ministry that we find, where does he go? He goes into the wilderness to be tested in his identity. The devil comes to him and says, who do you think you are? Did God really say this? Do you really know? Or do you really belong to the Father? And Jesus had to wrestle with his identity. In the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus is being crushed under the brutal reality of what he's called for, and he doesn't want to do it. He says, God, take this cup from me. I don't want, this, is not, this doesn't feel good. But what I love about Jesus is that instead of looking for solutions in self, or in culture. He looks to the solution in the word of God. He says, it is written. This is what my father defines me to be. And I'm not going to look for answers out here. I'm going to look for answers in my father's definition of who I am. I feel like that's just helping so many people here because we're, we're in the culture, not just of podcasts, but of influencers and people just telling you what's cool, what's right, what's not. And it's like, man, let's just look back to the source. Yeah. As Christ followers, as Christians, as believers in Christ, we've got to know every answer is found in him, in the word of truth, in the Bible. We've got to get ourselves in there. And if this scripture is bringing this feeling of fear and insecurity, let me remind you what the Bible says. God has not given you a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. God wants to give you clarity. And listen, you may not be there right now. You may not have it figured out. You may be in the wrestling match. Good. Good. Wrestle with God. 
Wrestle with who he's called you to be. Allow God to define that. But my encouragement as your pastor is this, push into his solution, his word, his answers. The world will try to tell you what those answers are, but God's word will define you, amen? This bleeds into our relationship. It, 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 it defines what the, if our personal purpose is to glorify God, then that dictates what our relationship should look like. Absolutely. Let's look at Genesis 128. It says, God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful. And that's it. That's where we're going to stop. Be fruitful. The reason why we're stopping there is because in the midst of trying to pursue our godly relationships, God gave us a clear picture of what these relationships are to produce. Mm. And that is to be fruitful. You see, in this world here, the things that we hear about the relationships that we're looking after, like think really about stuff that you're looking for, is to be happy, right? To have fun. Mm. I'm just looking for someone to have some fun with. I'm looking for a friend who's going to love me and just go on dates with me and travel the world and buy like the next home and raise a family. Like there are things that we think in this world encompasses a happy relationship. The fact is, God has a clearer definition of what this happy relationship is supposed to look like. It looks like a fruitful relationship. Mm. So the world will tell you, be happy, have fun. But the Bible says, be holy, mm. produce fruit. Produce fruit in this relationship. And that's a clear indicator in your relationships right now or in the ones that you're going to step into. Think, is this going to produce fruit? Is this producing fruit? Am I actually leading towards something that God wants to grow, to magnify more, to multiply even more? I think it's that word holy that we get a little bit intimidated by because I don't know about you, when I hear holiness, I hear hard, mm -hmm. grueling, God, become like Jesus. And we want our marriages and relationships to be, to be happy, fun, happy, right. easy. But the thing is, holy is happy. Come on. Holy is happy. Teach. Holy is happy. As Christians and Christ followers, we know that if God, our maker, designed us, he has a clear direction on how we are to be. Just like when you look at a dishwasher and... And yes, you can use it as a drying rack, but it's meant to wash dishes. That was They're, my illustration. That was, Come that was. Now. It's meant for something. And so our creator, when he created us, he meant us to have something. And for us, it was to be holy. Yeah. It was to give glory to God. Yeah. And in us pursuing and doing the exact thing that we were made for, that's where true happiness is. Come on. And I, I wanted to point us to the scripture here because it, it really lays it out for us without, I think, any debate. Galatians 5, 19 to 21. If you're still kind of struggling with this idea, well, worldly happiness sounds kind of nice. Well, I'm going to tell you what Paul says worldly happiness gives you. The acts of the flesh are obvious, and I'm not going to list all of it, but some of these things here are sexual immorality, impurity, idolatry, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition. Does this sound like some unhealthy relationships mm. here? Because in this world, that's what we experience when we're not pursuing the holiness of God. Yeah. Jealousy, fits of rage. And the incredible thing is that as we go, just a few verses later, Paul says, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Yeah. You cannot tell me that the world's happy is better than God's holy. Wow. You can't tell me that the fruit that comes from pursuing God is not better than what, what the world is going to give you. Yeah, I think Hollywood tells you, find anyone that makes you happy. And the scriptures say, find somebody that will make you holy. Find somebody that will help you become more like Christ. And I just wanna make this real practical. If you're single in the room, you're watching online right now, if you're looking for a potential partner, a potential mate, I know you're looking at who am I attracted to? Do we like the same music? Are we all Kings fans? Come on, Kings fans. That's great. The Bible says beauty fades. All of these temporal things, they pass away. But godly character remains. The question is, are you looking for the right things? Are you looking for someone whose prime purpose in life is to become like Jesus? Because listen, if you look for somebody who wants to be like Jesus, they're gonna love you like Jesus. They're gonna serve you like Jesus. They're gonna serve their kids like Jesus. They're gonna lead like Jesus. But if you're looking for something that's fading, that's passing away, 
That's what the relationship is gonna experience. And if you're married here, listen, I know you're like, well, it's too late for us. We're already married. I'm stuck with this one. <laughs> you can always recalibrate and readjust the priority. So you know what we've been living for ourselves? Let's live for Christ. You know, this business that we own together, it's great, it's making money, but you know what? Let's not just live for ourselves for profit. Let's live to honor God with this, to serve our community, to serve others, serve the kingdom of God. What can we do to prioritize becoming like Christ? And you know what? This is something I really felt like I needed to minister to you today. Some of you right now, your marriage is hard and you're experiencing difficulty. Now, I'm not talking about abuse. I'm not talking about infidelity. I'm just talking about the regular challenges that we all face in marriage. And you're using that difficulty as a reason and an excuse to get a divorce. And hear me, all the time we counsel couples, we hear this line over and over and over again. People say, Pastor, I just feel like it shouldn't be this hard. <laughs> Who said? Jack and Rose? Well, once again, we're not talking about abuse and infidelity. I'm talking about regular challenges, personality clashes, differences that we come from. When you get married, you go to the altar. What happens on an altar? Things die. When you get married, what you are saying is, I am laying down my life for the sake of this new union. That is not easy. That is challenging. That is hard. But when you are fighting for unity, when you are fighting for godliness, maybe that difficulty that you're saying doesn't belong in your marriage is actually a gift from God to make you more like Christ to invite you into the sanctification process, to invite you into becoming a better man. Listen, we've gone through some stuff. We've been through some fights. People always like, get surprised when I'm like, we've screamed at each I'm other I'm like, how before. much are you gonna share? <laughs> Look, I'm Italian, man, we get loud. But you know what I love about our marriage? Is that because our mutual pursuit is to become like Christ, we push each other towards sanctification. My wife challenges me to lead with integrity, to be a better man, to be a better husband. What I love about my marriage is that she pushes me to not just preach the word, but to practice it at home. Because what is it if I have your respect in the pulpit, but I don't have her respect in private? This is what a godly marriage does. It pushes each other to produce fruit. And what I love about him is that he pushes me as well. It's not in the same exact way, but I mean, for me personally, I don't love conflict. I don't love going at it, and I don't love sharing just all the disappointments and having those uncomfortable conversations. I'm not that type of person. But can I tell you, in the process of our marriage and the journey that we have been through, what I appreciate so much is his willingness to go there and his encouragement to help me get to a place where we can really connect. And it's so important because in that process too, I am being sanctified. I'm learning what it looks like to love beyond what is comfortable. I'm learning what that looks like in our marriage. That's great. Mm -hmm. I love you, babe. I love you too. Let's go. So we're gonna skip through the second point because we don't have a lot of time and we're gonna actually spend a week talking about this, but I do just wanna touch on it real quick. Verse 28, it says, God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and increase in number, fill the earth and subdue it, rule over the fish and the birds and every living creature. The second fruit that God wants you to produce in your relationship is the fruit of calling. You're not just made to hang out with each other. You're meant to accomplish something. God gave them a purpose and a destiny to accomplish together. And I think sometimes in marriage, it's easy, especially the longer you're married, to be successful separately. You do your thing, I'll do my thing. And because we're married, we're together, we're, we must be doing it together. But that's not always the case. And sometimes I think what we settle for is this, you be good and I'll be good. And then because we're kind of connected, good. we're good. <laughs> yeah. But God didn't want your relationship to just be good alongside of each other. God wants you to do good together. 
that's synergy, the sum that's greater than just adding two parts together. We multiply, we are fruitful, we increase in influence and impact, and what we can do together is so much greater than what we could do separately. And so we're gonna spend an entire week talking about calling Pastor Q and Lisa next week. They're gonna be sharing about a unified vision within the family, within the marriage. Really excited about that. But I do wanna jump to this final point because I think that this one is really, really important that we talk about today. And I think it's the one that we get most easily confused. And it's found in chapter two, verse 18. You wanna read that to them? Yeah, it says in verse 18, the Lord God said, it is not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. Yeah, this verse we've kind of used as the reasoning for many of our relationships. Well, God doesn't want me to be alone. Come on, we all know that one person that has the holiday hookup around the holiday season. They find some random person because they don't want to be alone. They got to go to the family functions. They got to keep up appearances. So they bring somebody around and you're like, who is this person? Who is this dude? But maybe they say this phrase. Maybe you've heard this before. Maybe you've even said it. I'd rather be with somebody than be alone. And I think that's a real feeling for many of us. Maybe even saying it like this, I'd rather settle for someone I know isn't right than to be by myself. Come on, God doesn't want me to be alone, right? He says, not good. And I really think we need to evaluate this verse because the last fruit that God wants your godly relationship to produce is the fruit of companionship. Not company. It's one thing to have company. It's another thing to have a companion. See, God cares that you have somebody in your life, but he's more concerned about the quality of the connection than simply the presence of any random person. God says, it's not good for man to be alone. Therefore, I will make a helper suitable for him. God didn't just find someone. He fashioned a suitor. The solution was not to address Adam's loneliness, but that in his loneliness, Adam didn't look like God. Why does God say it's not good for man to be alone? It's not just because Adam wasn't with anybody. It's because Adam didn't look like God in his loneliness. See, God said, let us make man in our image. That's because in the triune Godhead, there is perfect relationship between the Father, Son, and Spirit, perfect connection, perfect unity, perfect humility. And when God looks at Adam, he says, this does not reflect the image of who I am. You see, if it was just loneliness, it's just find some random person. But God makes a suitable helper for Adam. Why? Because any someone can eliminate your loneliness. And that's what the world will say. Just find somebody. Just don't be alone. But only someone suitable can make your love look like God's. I want to read this to you. This is the scripture that we preached on last year and got, uh, it went viral on TikTok because some people loved it, some people hated it. That's A lot it of works. men loved it, I'll tell you that. That's, That's true. Yeah. Finally, somebody's talking about it. <laughs> but I really want you to hear this with your heart. Ephesians chapter five, verse 21 is talking about marriage. It says, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Okay, who's he talking to right there, the husband or the wife? Both. Wives, submit to your husbands as you do to the Lord. I lost half of you right there. <laughs> For the husband's the head of the wife as Christ is the head of the church. Now I lost the rest of you. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit to their husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing through the washing of the water of the word and to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish or holy, but holy and blameless. In the same way, husbands, you ought to love your wives as your own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. Paul says here, y'all both submit to each other. And then he explains what this looks like. Wives, submit to your husbands. Husbands, love your wives. Both of these are sacrificial commands to lay your life down. Both of you have a job to do. Not just one. Stop pointing the finger at each other. You do your job and focus on your role. 
in serving and loving your spouse. Now, let me ask you a question. If we individually focused on just doing our part and both people in the relationship did this, how healthy would our marriages be? Come on. If we loved each other and served each other like this picture, how amazing would our marriages be? The problem is, is that we don't want to be a companion. We want company around us Mm. to meet our needs. Mm. So I want you to submit to me and honor me and respect me. But that's not my part. My part is, hey, Jared, love your wife as Christ loved the church. How did he do that? He came down, he laid all that, he laid his rights down. He suffered the most excruciating death on a cross. He was humiliated. He served even when people spat in his face, even when they didn't deserve it or earn it, he loved us selflessly. That's how you love your spouse. But when that's not my focus, and I'm more focused on what she's got to do than what I'm supposed to do, I don't want to be a companion. I just want somebody to meet my needs. Companionship is not just someone meeting your needs. It's you being willing to meet the needs of somebody else. I feel like what you are saying is know how to be a friend. As a spouse, as a partner, know how to be a friend. And it's the same thing when we talk about the fruit of companionship. It's not just about the cohabitation. It is the connection that matters. Being a friend is more than just being there. Now, granted, there are a lot of times in life where it's just so incredible to know that someone's going to be there. That's what we get to see in our partners, right? But at the same time, it can't just be being there. To be a great partner and to have a godly relationship looks like truly longing to connect, wanting to break past the patterns and the routines and the, oh, assumptions of what he's going to want or what she's going to say, but it's actually connecting in that very season. How are you right now? What is going on right now? How are you dealing with that thing that happened last week? Because you know, you know your spouse, you know the things that have hurt them and have challenged them, but are you willing to break past it so that it's not just you cohabitating with the person, Mm. but actually connecting with them? We do that with our friends sometimes better than we do it with our spouses. Oh, for sure. How, How easy is it for you to give everybody else the best of you and to come home? and to give your spouse the worst of you. We just had a conversation about this the other day. It's so easy just being transparent in ministry. Our job is to serve you and to love you, and so we're meeting with you, and we're you know, training you, and we're doing all this every day, and it's so easy for us to give so much during the day and to come home and to leave nothing left over for each other. And I think sometimes we think about our relationship, and you may even be in a place where you're like, friends. Like, I mean, this is my, you know, my spouse or my partner, but like, I got friends. We don't have anything in common. Can I tell you, Trin and I are very different from each other. She loves gardening and doing those things. And I, that's not what I like to do. I like to do CrossFit and I like to go, ah, like I like crazy stuff, you know? But if we're companions, part of being in a relationship is befriending one another and loving each other where the other person is at. What I love about my wife is that she knows how much CrossFit means to me. It's something I'm super passionate about. And so a few months ago, she decided to start doing that. At the beginning of the year, it's been four months straight, guys, three to four times a week. It's been incredible. Because she knows that that means something to me. And that's something we can talk about and we can share in just like the garden outside. Yeah. Just like doing that together. But my challenge for you is, are you just taking up space around each other? And I think this becomes easier the longer you're in a marriage. For sure. Because you just know everything about each other. What are we going to talk about? We just turn the TV on during dinner. But that's what I want to talk about is the proactive nature of breaking past that wall. You know, the other week, or actually probably that same week, We were in the middle of watching a show, just like we do every evening, had it on and just sitting in the dark. And in the middle of literally an important scene, he kind of just says to me, he turns to me and he just said, 
you know, I'm kind of struggling with da 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 But he said it so quickly and so softly, and it was not in a way of like, hey, we need to have a serious conversation. I need to tell you something. It was just kind of in the passing. And in that moment, it kind of clicked like, he's being vulnerable with me right now. He's trying to communicate something with me right now. And so I just didn't let it go. I turned back and I said, wait, it made you feel that way? You're feeling that way right now? And we had a conversation. The TV had to pause and we had a conversation right there. And I just, thank you. I mean, I thought I did a pretty good job in that situation too. <laughs> just being a good wife. But I just wanted to encourage everyone in this room. A lot of times we're, we have things going on, but we hold it to ourselves. And who are you going to talk to? I mean, your partner is right there. That's what that partner is there for. And I think there's two things that we have to realize. Application, some, some really like practical things. Number one is we've got to practice vulnerability. There has to be a willingness to practice vulnerability on both ends. Yeah. It's not just the one who's more emotive. It's not just the one who has more opinions. Both people. Yeah. And the second is that we have to practice responsibility. We have to be responsible to actually open up. Yeah. And we have to be responsible to respond to our partner's vulnerability. Yeah. Don't use it against them. Don't hold it against them. Care for them like how God would. Yeah, I think that I can even hear just in the spirit right now some people saying, well, Pastor Tran, that sounds great, but you don't know my marriage. And if I were to share those things, if I were to be vulnerable, my fear is that they would weaponize that against me, or that that would be seen as weakness and they wouldn't respect me anymore. And man, I feel for you. I understand that pain and that challenge. And so what's the solution to that? Because you can't change that person. Maybe you've tried and you realize how horrible that goes. That makes it worse. It makes somebody more and more bitter the more you try to change them and alter them. But something that's a real simple solution, and it seems simple, but it's actually the most difficult at times to do, is one simple thing you can do a day as a couple, and that's to start praying together. Now, it seems so simple, right? But how many of us would be honest and say, we actually do that? We sit down with our spouse and we pray together. I've talked to couples time and time again and say, that's, I don't, I don't know, that's kind of weird. And you may be feeling that right now, and we understand that because sometimes it is uncomfortable. Especially when we're fighting or when we feel distant from one another, that's the most challenging time because prayer is vulnerable. Opening up and sharing the desires of your hearts, asking the Lord to step into certain situations, it's extremely vulnerable. But the practice of it on the daily makes sure it, it encourages and it really just refocuses the two partners to focus back on Christ and to focus on a shared unified vision. Yeah, Pastor Q said a few weeks ago, I thought it was such a brilliant line when he was talking about revival in the home. He said, if during the pandemic, that was the first time you worship together with your spouse in your living room, we're doing it wrong. I thought that was so profound because I think for a lot of us, that was the first time because we couldn't go to church, we had to watch it online, that many of us actually worshiped with our family in the living room. And what's crazy is like, for some reason, praying together, spending that time together. Now, when I say pray together, I'm not talking about your pointed prayers. God, <laughs> I just pray for her right now. Would you open up her eyes and forgive her of her stubbornness? <laughs> that ain't prayer. I'm talking about real prayer. God, would you lead us and guide us in our marriage? God, would you speak to us? What do you want us to do individually right now so that we can come corporately together? Isn't it crazy? We can get naked with each other and we can't pray together? Why is that more embarrassing? Why does that feel more vulnerable? We're gonna talk about this in our final week when we talk about sex. How emotional and spiritual intimacy is the greatest form of intimacy beyond physicality. But why is it that we can do all these other things, but we can't pray together? That's the greatest way to knit your hearts together. I'll tell you what, when her and I, when we fight, when we argue, when we get into a disagreement, 
when we get away, when we pray separately and then we come to pray together, it's really, really hard for us to stay in that place, pitted against one another because the Spirit of God is there. And we take communion together sometimes, recalibrates our hearts to remind us of what Jesus has done for us. And I just wanna challenge you, if you're here and you're single today, when it comes to companionship, look for someone that really wants to live like Christ. Look for someone that is pursuing Jesus with their life. Look for someone that is exemplifying the characteristics of the fruits of the Spirit. You're in a great season right now. You can still make a decision. You still bail. You know, it's a really great place. Why we encourage people to serve, especially when you're single to serve in church, you get to see that. That's what I loved about our relationship. Before we started dating, before we got together, I got to see her character in serving other people. It's a great opportunity to watch the fruit of the Spirit exemplified in somebody's life. If you're married and you're already in a relationship, maybe you're struggling, have a conversation this week. Turn the TV off. Say, you know what, let's look at each other. Let's ask each other how we're really doing. And maybe you're at such a broken place in your marriage right now where you're not ready to go deep yet, then just start simple. What'd you do today? Tell, tell me activities about your day. Start small. You don't have to dive into the deep end right away. And then I really wanna challenge you. Pray together. Commit to prayer. Doesn't have to be long. Doesn't have to be this crazy, ah! Just, just take two minutes and the easiest way to do it is to do it right before bed. Sometimes we're laying in bed and you know maybe we were on our phones or something and I'm like, is he already half asleep? And I'll turn to him and I said, do you wanna pray? Sometimes he'll say, yes. Not in the sense that like, yeah, I wanna pray together. We always wanna pray together. We always are willing to go there. We're always willing to pray, especially at night right before bed. But when he's too tired or when he's already exhausted from the day, then I'm gonna pray. I will pray. Sometimes I won't even ask him and I will just start praying. And the reason why is because I'm willing to fight. I'm willing to fight for our unity, for our connection, for companionship. That's what I long for for the rest of you. Fight. Why don't you stand to your feet this morning? We're not a perfect marriage and we don't have all the answers, but we know the God who does. And for whatever season you're in in your life right now, I pray that this message was communicated in love to give you space to experience the grace of God. You don't have to be there. Maybe your marriage is falling apart. Maybe you're falling apart. Maybe you're confused. Maybe you're not even a Christian right now and you're still trying to figure out like whether you buy into any of this. I just want you to know this. There's so much grace for you. God loves you so deeply. In whatever place you're in in your life, he formed, he fashioned you, he didn't make a mistake when he created you. You're not an accident. It was intentional. And in the next few moments, we're just gonna give you an opportunity to respond to that. We're just gonna sing a worship song. But before we do that, we wanna pray for you. And I want you to bow your heads and close your eyes. If you're with that special someone, would you just make a point of t contact with them? Maybe grab hands or put your hand around their shoulder. Just, if you're with that person in a relationship right now, just connect with them. I'm going to pray over these marriages, these relationships today. And my wife, she's going to pray over the singles here. But I want to pray for you right now. Holy Spirit, would you move in this place? God, would you encourage every single heart? God, you know exactly where we are, where we've been, what we've walked through. And God, I pray right now that your mighty spirit, your grace, would wash over us. God, that you would heal the broken places in our relationships that only you can mend. God, would you give us clarity in the midst of confusion? And God, would you bring back connection where there's been separation? God, I pray that miracles would happen in this place. And God, that you would draw our hearts closer together as our marriages strive to glorify you. Lord, I thank you for every person walking through singleness in this season. God, the things of this world, the things that people tell them that they need or that they're lacking, God, I pray that they would see their complete and wholeness in you. Their identity is found in you. God, I thank you that you are always with them. 
that they are never alone, that they're never experiencing loneliness because they have a one and perfect God who cares about them, a father who's willing to be there, a spirit who's going to comfort them in all ways. God, I pray that in this season, they would explore and understand more of their identity in you that they would experience joy and happiness in this season and enjoy all that you have planned. God, that they would succumb to your plans, your will, and that they would find happiness in that. God, we bless every single person in this room. Would your Holy Spirit just comfort each person right now and minister to them. We love you in Jesus' name.